as we discussed, act as buffers. They help improve water quality by removing and filtering pollutants, maintain water levels, and provide fish and wildlife habitat. The, let's go to the next slide, Catherine. This is an example of a wetland that's been improperly drained. You can see all the, uh, you, can, you can see all the gullies and ditches there in the wetland uh, where the, that was drained without a permit. We have, we have uh, threats to the marshes include construction without maintaining proper buffers between the construction line and the marsh. In Georgia, we had an act passed in the 70s called the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act that was considered in the forefront of environmental marsh protection laws at the time. And basically it said that if you're going to construct something in the marsh, you have to demonstrate that there's not going to be any harm and that uh, that there's not going to be any harm and that it's in the public interest. Well, in the year since the, the Coastal Martian Protection Act has not been uniformly and consistently applied. One of the big issues under the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act is if you are building a structure in the marsh do you consider only the structure that is in the marsh itself, or must you also consider the upland portion of the development that is, that is created in connection with the structure in the marsh? For example, if a developer wants to build a thousand unit subdivision on the marsh and put in a community dock, well, of course, the community dock that's in the marsh is subject to the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act and is there's a finding is required that in order to build that dock, it has to be in the public interest. What about the thousand houses that are on the uplands for which that marina is being built? Do they have to be considered even though they're not in the marsh? A thousand houses produces a lot of stormwater runoff, a lot of pollution. It's all going down in the marsh. The reason the marina in the marsh is being built is to support the thousand unit subdivision in the uplands. There's been a big debate in Georgia over the last few years about the reach of the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act. What the Supreme Court recently decided was that the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act extends only to structures that are actually in the marsh, such as the dock itself, and to the upland portions of a development if the result of the upland portion of the development is going to be physical damage in the marsh akin to dredging or filling. So for example, if this thousand unit subdivision in the upland portion in the marsh is going to produce such volume and quantity and velocity of stormwater that it's actually going to scour the marsh, dig it out, kill the vegetation akin to dredging, then there has to be a finding that there has to be limitations put on that. It's regulated by the Coastal Marshlands Protection Act. But in the absence of the ability to demonstrate actual physical harm from the upland portion of the marsh, the state uh, doesn't regulate it. Another issue that this is a marsh hammock. This is a house on a marsh hammock. That bridge is built over the public's property. Those are things that we're concerned about. Docks in Georgia. Between the data that the state maintains on dock permitting is way behind and it's not very accurate. But we've been able to determine that between 1995 and 2002, almost 1,700 private docks were permitted, eight new marinas and 14 commercial docks. Now that data is several years old and the reason it's not more recent is because the state doesn't maintain up-to-date data. In order to build a dock in Georgia, and again, there may be some exceptions to this. I'm speaking in generalities here. First, the owner of the property has to get a ground lease from the state because the marsh is the state's property. Then the owner has to get a permit to actually construct the dock in the marsh, although for the most part, single family privately owned docks are exempt from the permitting process. They're, they're, they're in effect automatically permitted. What we're seeing down here now are, is the permitting of extremely long docks. 
1,000 foot docks, 1,100 foot docks, 1,200 foot docks. Now, to hear, to talk about a 1,000 foot dock may not mean much in the abstract, but go by some of these locations where a 1,000 foot dock has been permitted and look at it and you will see it's extraordinarily long. And depending on, and it's over the public's property. The extremely long docks present problems other than aesthetic problems. Some of these docks extend so far out into the waterway that they literally prevent the marsh grass as it dies off from migrating down the river out to the sea. You may have seen pictures in the Savannah paper that have covered some of these long dock situations here in the Savannah area where somebody has been permitted to build an extraordinarily long dock and you can have literally acres of dead marsh grass uh, held up behind the long docks. We're concerned about that. We're concerned that every beautiful stream and river down here in Savannah uh, doesn't become, uh, doesn't just fill with docks so that the, so that the natural, uh, natural beauty and the natural functions of the, of the systems are, uh, are maintained. Let's go to the next slide, Catherine. We, after developing our plan and our report on the coast and the threats on the coast, we began working very closely with our, what we call our partner groups. Uh, we work with all of the groups, virtually all of the groups down here on the coast who are involved in river protection and coast protection issues. From the Savannah Riverkeeper all the way down to the Altamaha Riverkeeper, we're their lawyers. We work for them at no charge. We, working with our partner groups, have formed a coalition that we call the Save Our Coast Coalition. It currently consists of 12 groups. Virtually every group here on the coast has anything to do with coastal protection issues. The Georgia Conservancy, the river protection groups, the coast protection groups, all of those groups. We're working together in an effort to identify the resources that are most threatened, the marshes, the wetlands, the stream buffers, to marshal our resources, to identify and work on the areas that are most threatened, and to try to uh, bring improvement to the protections uh, here on the Georgia coast. As I said, our mission is to protect the public's interest in the public's resources. Uh, you know, I hear many I hear, I hear accents from all over the room as we've met you this morning and walked around and, and chatted. And I don't know if when you were in school in other parts of the country, if you studied Southern poets like we did if we grew up down here. Catherine, let's go, let's go to the end here. In 1878, Sidney Lanier wrote the famous poem, The Marshes of Glen. Well, this poem could have been written about any of the coastal counties. And this is just a, an excerpt from the Marshes of Glen, written, keep in mind, 130 years ago. And I ask you, as you read this portion of the poem, to ask whether this poem could be written today. Can it be written in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 130 years from now? The world lies east, how ample the marsh and the sea and the sky. A league and a league of marsh grass, waist high, broad in the blade, green and all of a height, and unflecked with a lighter shade stretched leisurely off in a pleasant plain to the terminal blue of the main. Oh, what is abroad in the marsh and the terminal sea? Somehow my soul seems suddenly free. From the weighing of fate and the sad discussion of sin by the length and breadth and the sweep of the marshes of Glen. I hope that when the Rotary Club on Skidaway meets 130 years from now, someone can read the marshes of Glen and the marsh that we have here in Chatham all the way down to Glen will still be recognizable. Thank you very much. <laughs>